Very big thanks uh, from my side for, I think, some very uh, open uh, and wide-ranging debates today on Hyperloop, which, as I said in my opening, is a, a topic that we see from the Commission perspective as being something certainly uh, very interesting that we see huge potential in and that we want to, to follow and support. I think compared to our first conference in Frankfurt last year, what is pretty clear is that we have moved some way along the, the Gartner hype cycle. And I think that's a good thing because that means there is a lot of serious work going on. And that serious work, of course, exposes the difficulties, the issues, as well as the potential. But that, that's the way we will get and hopefully rapidly get to a commercial product. Of course, it does also result in things like uh, yesterday's New York Times article, which was, as you all know, not necessarily what you all wanted to hear at the moment. And I think that gives us an important challenge uh, because for the work we're doing in the Commission, for the work you're doing, we do need to ensure that we can credibly put the word out there that this is something that is coming, that it's worth us spending time and money developing with you. And I think that then brings us to the, the next step, which, of course, we've heard a lot of discussion on today, particularly in the last panel. When is this coming? When is this a reality? And I think for, for us to say that this is part of the solution to climate change, to us getting to net zero by 2050, we've got to have something by 2030 or very soon afterwards, which is really there in the market as something which is operational. If we leave it much longer than that, it's something that, well, it's a great idea, but it's never really coming. We need to use other solutions. So I, we know the difficulties, but we've got to get there on that. I think what happens after that in terms of how quickly the system develops depends really on exactly what the system is for. And we've heard again this discussion in the last panel, are we building something which is really for freight, for short distances? Or are we doing something which fulfills the original vision of Hyperloop as something which could be for very long distances at very high speeds? And I think there is a completely different business case for that. And I'm slightly worried when we say, well, there is a need for capacity. Sure, there's a need for capacity. But if there's a need for capacity, we can fulfill that need for capacity by building new roads or new railways or simply leveraging the technology for rail that Carlo and I spend our day jobs mostly doing, or leveraging the connected and automated vehicles and electrification of the roads. If, if the choice is between doing an automated road, doing a modern railway, or doing a Hyperloop, it's not necessarily so obvious why we would do Hyperloop. If the choice really is that we can show Hyperloop is a very low carbon means of doing it, very low impact means of doing it, then we will do Hyperloop. If we can show that Hyperloop is a way of crossing the continent at 1,000 kilometers per hour, then we will do Hyperloop. So I, I think if we lose some of that vision, there is a danger that actually the whole case for Hyperloop becomes weaker. Now, if we're using those freight uh, tunnels, for example, as a stepping stone, as a proof of concept to finally get to the big picture, I think that's vital and that, that's the way to do it. But not, as, not if that's all we're doing because then then you're just competing with the other modes, and why would you build something which doesn't interoperate with, which isn't already part of the existing systems? We heard also a lot about convergence, uh, about the need for standardization, for harmonization, and I think, again, that is something that we see as important. We've always said that that's not something that, at the level of the European Union, we're going to sit down and pick the winners. Maybe with some of the processes we're working on with you, we can help facilitate that. But I think it is clear, nonetheless, that if Hyperloop is to have potential as a, a broad network, it has to rapidly come to some degree of convergence. And here, it's not just about interoperability. It's not about joining one tube up with another. I mean, again, to go what we've spent half this week telling our rail colleagues, it, making the railway standard isn't simply about interoperability. It's also about a harmonized product and therefore a product which can be built at commercial scale and without huge costs and complexities. And it will be the same for Hyperloop. You can all build five, six different systems, but if you do that, you won't reach the scale where any of them can be commercialized easily. 
So you need to drive that harmonization, I think, so that you get something which even if the, the individual tubes don't join up, they all apply the same technology and they can all therefore be delivered uh, at a price which makes it economic, which means you can really compete with and say you will be better than the road or the railway or better than aviation and make that work. So I, I think to close, I mean, we remain as committed as ever to working with you to deliver this. I think it's very good that we've heard a lot of the detailed work that is being done by the component manufacturers. Again, that is showing that we're, we're really getting there, that we actually have Hyperloop as something which now is an engineering concept that can be delivered and not simply a great idea. But for us to take that work forward, for us to be able to credibly go to our colleagues in the Commission over the course of the next year and say we want a regulatory framework, we want to put that into legislation, we need you to be working hard with us to show that there is still a very strong case for Hyperloop and that you can deliver it credibly in that next seven year period essentially. So I think we've heard a lot of good work on that today, a lot of acknowledgement of the difficulties of getting there, but I hope that also means that that means we find the solutions and we do get there because we need this as part of our solution to a, a huge problem. Thank you. Good luck to you. Um, actually, it's going to make my life a little bit easier. I think a lot of what you've said was what I was going to cover. <laughs> So thank you for that, very much for that. Um, it's actually been a pleasure sitting at the back and not being here as part of the conference. So I've been listening to everybody instead of telling everybody what I thought. Um, but really interesting. And we've spoke a lot about progress, OK? Let me tell you what progress is. Having everybody in this room talking about the industry, talking about aligning the industry. Because when I first came into this technology, we wouldn't even be in the same room together. Yeah, so I think now that we're actually starting to, the whole industry is starting to mature. And I think that is a credit to everybody here uh, taking part in the conference today because without actually getting together, without exchanging ideas, without exchanging the challenges and the issues, this industry is not going to move forward. Okay, so I think that's been a credit. I think the other thing is, I think there's a huge engagement now with the authorities, with the governments, with the institutions that we have to rely on with respect to the regulations, because I think we're at a point now where, as you've just mentioned, standardization, yeah? Interoperability. All these are key questions that get asked time and time again, especially if you're looking at networks and not just isolated programs or projects. Um, I think on top of that, I think there is a, uh, a, there's also a dilemma, I think, here. There was a lot of talk about progress and uh, getting to a point of uh, concept, you know, POC. Um, all the, 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 the industry is currently doing is it's being bankrolled by pri uh, private money, private investors. But we do need to get uh, to a point where I think there is a, a, a visible pipeline of what this industry has to offer to obtain and seek further funding, which would allow the companies to then grow and go beyond the POC. Because I think, uh, absolutely, I was talking to Dieter earlier on, uh, once you hit the POC, I think the money will flood in. But getting to the POC is that catch-22 at the moment. And I think, you know, uh, we've been trying desperately to get more and more uh, support, concrete support. You'll never get concrete support from uh, governments at this stage in the, uh, the, the, the technology, but getting more and more support as we go forward, which enables the industry and investors to see that this is actually now going to actually happen providing the progress on the technology meets those milestones. Um, I think there's some ambitious discussions going on today. 3,000 kilometers by 2030. I don't know what we're doing in this room. We should be out there actually working. <laughs> uh, not talking about it. And I think Carlo said, you know, a lot of talk, but not enough action. Um, I think that is a, a, is, is a great target. It's a vision. And we need to actually get on and uh, move the industry forward, support that. Um, what else have I got here? I mentioned, we've mentioned interoperability. Um, yeah, I wanted to say something a little bit about the vision. And there's been a lot of discussion today, cargo versus passenger, one or the other or both. But ultimately, let's not forget where the power of this technology lies. Ultimately, it's there to change the way 
we live our lives. And I think that's important. And I think, you know, moving cargo is the stepping stone. I think it's absolutely the right thing. Um, but it's a stepping stone to ultimately get to where the, uh, the, the real benefits lie. And when we start looking at the benefits, it's a socioeconomic benefits. And I think it goes back to, you know, we mentioned sustainability. Well, that's part of it. The other part is about creating uh, opportunities, about creating growth, creating a new industry on the back of which people can invest, organizations can invest, and governments can actually support. So it's the whole ecosystem that sits behind this that I think is so important. But ultimately, I think it's a mix, and I think it is both passenger and it is both cargo. But cargo, as I said, is a stepping stone. It's incremental. And it was good to see, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a spectrum of um, uh, approaches uh, now where, you know, you've got certain organizations or companies that are going to go for the big bang. Some are going for uh, an incremental approach like Novomo. Um, but all of them, I think, will start merging. And it all will sit around the interoperability and standards. Which leads me on to the final thing, and I'm going to talk about infrastructure. And I think infrastructure is the, probably the single biggest area that you can actually standardize fairly quickly. Once you know what that is, then I think the rest of it becomes technology driven. But at the moment, I think setting the standards around infrastructure and what that is, is critical. Uh, even the size of the tube. Do you know how many times I've had discussions about what size the tube should be? And every time we have that discussion, the, 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 the cost benefit changes dramatically, I think the industry needs to get itself round and start really uh, homing in on uh, trying to drive these numbers and setting the standards. And then you can put that to the one side. Infrastructure should not ling no longer be a, a point of concern. It's the technology. That should be the, 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 the real concern. Um, finally, where is it going to happen first? <laughs> um, it was great to, to hear D.B. Schenker saying it's going to be India. Uh, I, I'm going to go with what Pierre actually said. I think it'll be wherever it'll be. Um, I think it'll be, you know, supported. I think the work that the European Commission is doing, you know, it started in the, in, in the US, the Department of Transport, moved on to the European Union here. Work, a lot of work being done over in India as well with Niti Ayag and uh, the Ministry of Transport there. Um, I think it'll be wherever it'll be. I think, let's see. But I think, you know, I think Europe is starting to become an emerging front runner. It's funny because, you know, when I started in the industry, it was the Middle East, right? It then went into India, uh, then US, and back to India. And now Europe is starting to emerge. And I think that's a, a credit to the, uh, the European Union, uh, the, uh, the, the cluster, I think Mars, as you put it earlier on, sitting here in Europe and creating that momentum. So. Um, I think that's all I've got to say. I think I've covered most points there. I think here you've covered the rest. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I hope you have a, uh, an enjoyable uh, rest of your evening and uh, safe trip back home. Thank you.